Hello, my name's Dr. Raphael Hallett from the University of Leeds. My previous two podcasts have been about forms of transition you'll make as you move from A-level to university on the one hand, and as you develop through university on the other. Now for this podcast called History and Employability, I'm going to roll forward a few years and ask you to imagine yourself as a history student just at the cusp of going outside of university and moving into a professional context. Now, I'm asked a lot these days about what will I get out of a arts degree. And we'll be talking about arts degrees generally and the kinds of skills that they give you for professional, societal and cultural contexts. And I'll be narrowing that down in a series of case studies or scenarios to talk about how I think you as a history student will be able to take particular skills, aptitudes, abilities out there beyond the horizon of the university. I'm often asked today which are the most vocational or useful subjects to do at university. And so there seems to be a lot of um, false information out there at the moment about this divide between vocational, useful, valuable subjects on the one hand and non-vocational or arty-farty subjects on the other. And what I want to do today is break down that myth a bit. Because, yes, there are certain vocational subjects like dentistry, medicine, engineering that will more naturally lead you into particular professions. But the thing to think about in terms of arts degrees, or history degrees in particular, is they don't lead to one career, but they lead into many careers. They lead into a whole diverse range of options in terms of your professional context outside of university. So, what I want to do today is define the value of a history degree beyond its academic and beyond its intrinsic qualities to make you think about what you can take out of a degree in history to different contexts and different societies, different communities of work. So the way I'm going to do that is first of all come up with a series of identities, if you like, or personalities that develop as you, as you move through university as a historian. I'm not talking about some kind of split personality here, but more a series of capabilities that you emerge from. And then I'll be illustrating these capabilities in a series of scenarios. They're hypothetical, but hopefully you'll, they'll allow you to grasp the ways in which you can use history skills in particular contexts at work. But let's start with a quote. Now, this is from Damon Horowitz, and he's the director of engineering at Google at the moment. And he's got this thing to say about arts professionals. And he says, you go into the humanities, the arts subjects, something like history, to pursue your intellectual passion. But you emerge from that experience as a, what he calls, a much-desired commodity. So we don't want to commodify ourselves too much and think of ourselves as just a package of skills. But what I want to explain is what he really means about emerging from a humanities degree like history as, a, as something and someone that is valued by the business and professional community. And as I take you through these case studies or scenarios, hopefully that idea will become clearer and richer as I progress. So my first case study here is about this identity you develop as a historian, which I'll call the rigorous researcher. So you'll spend three years at university adapting and refining your skills as a researcher. Obviously, you'll be looking primarily at history-specific material. But what I'm going to try and explain is the way that aptitude as a rigorous, uh, evaluative, critical researcher can help you in other contexts too. Let's think about the ways you form that identity then. Well, throughout your history degree, right from the moment you arrive at university, you're going to be selecting, distilling, epitomizing information from a wide range of sources, libraries, archives, online databases. Within that plethora of evidence, you'll be interpreting and, and honing yourself towards the key evidence, the key issues. So you'll already be good at distilling, bringing together the information into the finer, most relevant points. You'll be dealing with complex texts, debates, different approaches. Information will be coming at you from different angles, different contexts, different cultures. So you'll be repackaging and assimilating that information throughout the three years of your degree. On a more micro level, if you like, to think about the microcosm of your research, you'll be spotting errors, contradictions, bias, prejudice. You'll get very good at spotting not only the good information that's out there, but the bad and taking the wheat from the chaff, if you like. As a more open-ended researcher, a more speculative researcher, you'll collaborate, you'll listen to other sides of the argument, and you'll bring together information from different perspectives. And that, that's something I'm going to be returning to throughout this presentation. That ability is rare. 
that ability to identify, isolate, and bring together information is something that not all professionals will have. And thinking further on into your degree, what will you be doing in your third year? This is something I talked about in a previous podcast. But in your third year, you'll produce a body of original research. You'll essentially be directing your own research project, setting your own questions, structuring and mapping your research, and producing an original body of evidence and commentary. This is something that's prized not only in the typical industries, say charity, heritage, teaching, but every business needs a good project manager. Every business needs a good researcher, and as a history graduate, you'll be able to provide that. So let's think of a scenario in which this, this skill, this rigorous research skill, is going to be useful. Well, okay, let's think about it in local terms, first of all. You're nearing the end of your university degree. You've got a range of corporate literature in front of you. You're scanning, you're moving through, you're skimming through uh, electronic literature, websites, online material. You're deciding who you want to work for, who might want you. And this is a difficult job. Every brochure will seem to say the same thing. Every corporate piece of rhetoric will ask you about your capabilities, your desire, your ethos, and will promise you uh, career prospects, perks, uh, creative thinking, and so forth. But as a researcher, as a historian, you'll be good at spotting the, the empty evidence and the true lines that will appeal to you. So you'll look at these online pieces of information, you'll collect together the corporate literature, and you'll be able to spot the routes into work, the routes into employment that are beneficial for you. You'll be able to, in a sense, translate and decode that literature, because that's what you've been doing for three years. You'll find the bits that are interesting. You'll find the key points about the type of company that you're going to be working for, the forms of development that you'll be able to pursue. And so let's picture you in that scenario. Looking through the literature, checking out the websites, you'll spot an internship program here, a particular career development path there. You'll spot a moral or a charitable cause perhaps that company is involved in that makes you more suitable to that company than to others. Essentially, you've researched your job prospects as a historian, and so you're already stepping ahead in the race for recruitment. The other form of identity um, that I think is particularly important in your early stages of, of employment or recruitment is the, is the idea of you being a communicator and the persona that is the effective com communicator. I'd like to say a bit more about that. As you develop during your history degree, you'll go through that settling in period where you might observe the practices and experts around you. But quite quickly, as I've been explaining in my previous podcast, you'll pick up and refine the skills of of debate, of communication, and of presentation. So let's think about the skills that you actually come out with um, when you move from a history degree to, a world of, to the world of work. You've got a refined writing style. Essentially, you'll be a good writer. You've practiced, you've refined, you've developed your writing skills over three years. You'll have articulated your ideas again and again in different contexts. You'll have produced clear presentations, persuasive forms of argument to peer groups of students, tutors, lecturers, perhaps even outside audiences beyond the university. Essentially, you'll be a good communicator in that you'll have to have adapted your history-specific knowledge to different audiences as you have progressed through your degree. You'll have spoken to your history friends. You'll have articulated ideas to your tutor in a relatively intimate way, but then you may have given a paper in a conference, in a university conference, which is a whole different tone, a whole different register. So you have disseminated your ideas to different audiences, history friends, tutors, in, a, in a, an intimate way, but you may have also given conference presentations where you've talked to an audience that's less familiar with your topic. You'll become an adaptable and flexible communicator. And let's think of a scenario now, then, where you might be able to use these skills. OK, let's roll forward a bit from your application. You've got an interview, and you walk into the interview room. You're faced with a panel, and it's a mixed audience. They have different roles in the company, they have different levels of seniority, and they all have a slightly different idea of what that company means, where it's going forward, what's, what's to prioritize in their business. The thing is, as a history graduate, you'll have faced these kinds of challenges before different audiences, different perspectives, different approaches to essentially the same question. They'll all be wanting you to fit into the company, but they'll all want you to fit into it in certain different ways. So as you progress through that interview, imagine you reacting as a history graduate. You'll tune into their questions. You'll empathize with the context from which they're speaking, the roles which they prioritize, their background within the company. 
You'll articulate your ideas, your hopes and your objectives to each person, but you'll also probably be able to make links between the questions that they've asked. You may be even in that luxurious position of being able to link together their questions and summarise how you think they work, let alone how they think you should work for the company. So by the end of the in uh, interview, you'll be able to synthesise the questions, bring their views together, perhaps even open up the interview a bit with a few speculative questions yourselves about what that company is doing, what its hopes are, what its projects are in the future. Because remember, you'll have done this in history presentations. You'll be as good at closing down the subject as you are at opening up the topic. And it's that mixture of conviction and speculation that will serve you well in these sorts of interview contexts. 